I guess the whole point of us uh, being here is, and I can speak from a landlord point of view, is I've made my mistakes early on uh, when I uh, got into the business of becoming a landlord um, uh, by thinking that, you know, I do my numbers on a piece of paper, see what's, what's a good investment, buy that property, advertise, fill it, and my job is done. And I found over the years that uh, it's the other way around, that actually my job just began. And it uh, behooves all of us to know our business and know the uh, political and uh, uh, the regulatory uh, aspect of our industry. So uh, residential tenancy branch does not um, write the legislation. They do not write the act. Um, they administer it. So the questions that should be, answer, uh, should be asked would be a lot more productive if you ask uh, specific questions on the act, if there's any confusion or if there's something you don't know. But really, this is not a debating session of whether you agree with a certain legislation or not, because nothing will come of it. Um, just, I know that <laughs> everybody's poised, but um, it, it's, you know, I give the same example, and it took me a while to understand it myself, but I give an example is if, uh, if you're speeding and you get caught, um, whether you agree with the speed limit or not, uh, it is, it's irrelevant, and you can't really blame the police officer for stopping you either, because He's just doing what he's supposed to. Um, the same type of thing here. Uh, having said that, I want to introduce uh, Michelle uh, Corrigo. Uh, she is the um, RTB officer uh, in the rent regulation uh, department. Um, and she has obviously uh, a few words uh, about the, the act and uh, a few topics uh, to, to go over. And after that, we'll have our questions. Thank you. So with that, Michelle. Thanks. Okay, so uh, like Mark said, my name is Michelle Corrigal. I've been with the Residential Tenancies Branch now for, um, I guess I'm going into my eighth year. And in that capacity at the branch, I've worked as a client services officer for two years, and that's the front line question and answers. We do intakes over the phone and walk-ins. Um, for the last six years, I've been a rent regulation officer, so I've done applications above the guideline as well as compliance. And I've also um, spent some time overseeing at hearings. So um, with that, we'll start. The uh, Residential Tenancies Branch has four main roles. Um, the first is information and education. And what we do is we give information to the landlords and tenants on their rights and responsibilities under the Residential Tenancies Act and the Life Leases Act and our procedures. Uh, we provide information over the phone, through walk-in interviews, or by the mail. We make presentations on our legislation, like this one, uh, to groups of landlords and tenants or other individuals, and we offer seminars to educate people on landlords and tenants' rights and responsibilities. And we have fact sheets on several topics of interest in landlords and, to landlords and tenants, and, and I've included some of them in your packets. We do have more fact sheets at the branch that are available. Uh, the second um, thing we do is we investigate. So we investigate possible breaches of the Residential Tenancies Act and the Life Leases Act and provide background information to resolve the disputes. Third uh, thing that we do is mediation, and this is an important part of um, what we do at the branch. The staff attempts to mediate most disputes between landlords and tenants. So if you have a, a dispute between a security deposit, claims for compensation, or even termination notices, that's something that we will um, work with a landlord and a tenant to resolve before it goes to the hearing process. So uh, mediation is done by telephone and teleconference, face-to-face -face or in writing. Mediation agreements are always confidential between the landlord and the tenant. Uh, the agreement is always confirmed in writing, and an agreement can be enforced if, a party, if the party fails to live up to the agreement. So, um, because they're confidential, they're not, um, they're not out, uh, what am I trying to say? They're not available to the public, but if one of the parties breaches the agreement, it becomes public record at that point because an order will be issued. And the final thing that the branch does is adjudication, and that's the decision-making process. Decisions are either made at a hearing or from written information received from a landlord and a tenant during the investigation. The landlord and the tenant are encouraged to attend the hearing with their evidence and their witnesses, and all decisions are issued in writing and reasons for the decision are given. And all decisions are appealable to the Residential Tenancies Commission. So I'd like to talk a little bit about rental unit condition reports. 
The conditional report is a written detailed description of the condition of the rental unit when a tenant moves in and out. Conditional report can help protect the landlords and the tenant if there's a disagreement at the end of the tenancy. The branch will provide you with a copy of this form. There is one provided in the packet for you, um, but you can create your own. It's not a requirement to complete this form, but we recommend it. If your tenant requests ones, then, then you do have to do one. You or your tenant can ask that a condition report be done when the tenant moves in and again when they move out. And a condition report should also be done when a unit is sublet or assigned or when a tenant moves a pet into the unit during the tenancy. You and the tenant should carefully check the unit together. Any damages should be written down on the form, even something as small as a scratch or a burn. You and the tenant should sign and date the condition report and the tenant should get a copy and you should keep one for your records. When your tenant moves out, you should go through the check, check the unit together. Damages that were not there when the tenant moved in should be listed on the condition report. You should each date and sign this last report and keep a copy. And you may want to use this final report to come to an agreement on the refund of the deposit. So this is something if there is um, a claim against a security deposit, we will look at at the branch. Was there a condition report done when, you moved in, when the tenant moved into the unit? Were are these items all marked off? Were you able to do a condition report with a tenant when they leave? Sometimes that's not always possible. We, we would um, want you to do a condition report anyway, even if the tenant does not make themselves available. Um, you're going to want to take photographs and everything, but this is, this is part of your evidence if you do have to make a claim against a tenant security deposit. So, types of deposits. The Residential Tenancies Act allows you to collect a deposit for any of the following things. A security deposit, you can now collect a pet damage deposit, and tenant services security deposits, and that's for tenancies that include um, tenant services like light meals, housekeeping, things like that. For each deposit, you must tell the tenant that a deposit is required before they sign the tenancy agreement, or if it's a pet deposit before they, you allow the pet. Uh, you give the tenants a receipt that shows the amount of the deposit, the date you received it, and the address of the rental unit and the residential complex. And if you collect a deposit, you hold the deposit until the end of the tenancy. Tenants can only use the money for the last month's rent if you agree to that in writing. So, um, for security deposits. Landlords can charge tenants a security deposit when the tenancy starts or if they assign their tenancy agreement. At the end of the tenancy, the security deposit can be used to cover any unpaid rent, damage, or extraordinary cleaning caused by the tenant. And a security deposit cannot be more of, the ha of half of the first month's rent. If the rent payable is 800, the security deposit can't be any more than $400. Pet damage deposit. When you let a tenant have a pet in the rental unit, you can charge them a pet damage deposit. A pet damage deposit, again, can't be more than half of the month's rent, and you can only charge one deposit no matter how many pets you allow. You can use this to cover any extraordinary cleaning needed or damage done to a unit or a residential complex that's caused by the pets. And if you allowed a tenant to have a pet and you didn't collect the deposit, you can't go back and collect a deposit from them now. You cannot charge a pet damage deposit for tenants who rely on a service animal. Service animals are not considered pets. When a tenant moves out, if there are no problems at the end of the tenancy, you have to return all of the deposits plus the interest to the tenant within 14 days at the end of the tenancy. You may want to keep all or part of the deposit if the tenants have not paid rent or tenant service charges. Tenants or their pets have damaged the rental unit or the residential complex, or tenants or their pets have left the unit dirty. If you claim against a deposit, you have to, spe you have to send tenants a written notice of the claim against the deposit. If your claim is for less than the deposit, you have to return the balance that isn't being claimed. And if you and the tenant do not agree on the charges against a deposit, either one of you can ask the branch to make a decision. And again, this is where mediation comes in. The branch will try to help you settle the claim through mediation, but if mediation is not successful, a branch officer will decide who gets to keep the deposit and the interest and the officer will make the decision by reviewing all the information provided by both parties 
and asking the landlord and tenant and their witnesses to come to the branch to a hearing. So now and we'll talk about different types of notices of termination. Giving a notice for non-payment of rent. So you can give a tenant a notice to move out if the tenant has not paid their rent. If the tenant pays, fails to pay their rent within three days after it's due, you may give the tenant a notice. So if their rent is due on the first, there's a grace period of the second, the third, and the fourth. On the fifth day, you can give that tenant a termination notice. The notice of termination must be in writing and on the approved RTB form and signed by you. The notice of termination for non-payment of rent is also included in your packets. There you go, it's form eight. Uh, this form is available on, uh, at our office or it's also available on our website. Anyway, the form must include all of the following information. Total amount of rent owing, the date when the tenant must move out, why the tenant has to move, the address where the tenant lives, a statement that says the tenant can dispute a landlord's notice if the tenant has a right to dispute any notice of termination that they receive, and a statement that says if the tenant pays the total amount shown on the notice and any other amount that is owing on the date they pay, they will not have to move out unless the landlord tells them that the notice is still in effect due to habitual lateness and this needs to be in writing. So what we consider habitual late is um, paying your rent late three or more times in a 12 month period. So if a tenant has been late uh, three or more times and you've given a termination notice and they pay you the money, you can still ask them to vacate, um, but you have to do that in writing and you have to state because they've been habitually late. So if a tenant pays the deposit with an NSF check, you can also give the tenant a notice of termination. Again, this can be a five-day notice to move out. If the tenant pays the deposit and any administrative costs within the five days, they can stay in the unit. If a tenant gives you an NSF check for a pet deposit, you can give the tenant a five-day notice to remove the pet. If the tenant pays the deposit and any administrative costs within the five days, then the notice is cancelled. And if the tenant does not pay the amount owing and does not remove the pet, you can give the tenant a five-day notice of termination. So when you serve a notice, you must deliver a notice of termination in person to an adult in the residence. If you are delivering this notice to a tenant at their workplace, then it must be given to the tenant directly. So you can't hand it over to a co-worker and expect that the co-worker is actually going to serve it on the tenant. But if you go to the residence and um, they have an adult child or they've got um, a friend over visiting, as long as that person's an adult, they answer the door at the tent at the residential complex, then you can hand the notice over to them. After you give the notice to the tenant, the tenant may offer to pay the rent, and if the tenant offers to pay the rent, you can take the rent and allow the tenant to stay in the rental unit, or again, if the tenant's been habitually late, which is um, what I was discussing before, three or more times in a 12-month period, you take the rent and you tell the tenant immediately in writing that you still consider the tenancy to be terminated and that the tenant still has to move. I believe that I have given you a sample of a habitual late notice that's also in your packet, which you should consider handing over to the tenant if you still want to end the tenancy. Uh, you must give the tenant the written confirmation at the time of payment or shortly thereafter if the tenant paid the rent in person to you or the caretaker or send the notification within one business day if the tenant deposited or mailed the rent money to you. And then if you are unable to serve the tenant with the notice, you can come to the branch and apply for what's called substitutional service. And the branch may give you permission to serve the tenant in some other way by placing it under the door in their mailbox, taping it to the door. Um, and then if the tenant does not move out in accordance with the notice, you still have to come back to the branch and apply for what's called an order of possession. You'd be serving the tenant with hearing documents and then it would be decided at a hearing whether the tenant has to vacate or not. So if you are giving notice for reasons other than non-payment of rent, um, you can give a tenant the notice if they break a rule that you have or breach a part of their tenancy agreement. Um, you have to give them written notice. You can give them written notice if they don't keep the rental unit reasonably clean because that's an obligation of a tenant. 
Uh, damage the rental unit, complex, or property. Disturb others in the building, complex, or nearby properties. Or if they change the lock on the rental unit without your permission. If they threaten the safety of others in the building or the complex. If they break a term of a tenancy agreement, example, you know, no pets, or um, if they're barbecuing on the balcony and you've got a rule that uh, says that there's no b barbecuing on the balcony, you can terminate for that. Um, and if they let too many people live in the rental unit, so unauthorized occupants. You have, in this situation, you're required to give the tenants a written warning, telling them they have to correct the problem. And then if the tenant doesn't correct the problem, you can give them written notice. And the length of a notice is one rental payment period. So uh, this is something that you need to be aware of. If they pay their rent on the 1st of June, you need to give them notice on or before May 31st to be out for June 30th. So you always want to make sure you give notice on or before the last day of the month prior. If you, give it, if you were to give notice on June 1st, then you're already into another rental period. They wouldn't have to move out until the end of July. And then if the problem is really serious, like threatens the health or safety of others, then you can give notice to move out without a warning letter. And the length of notice is five days. If you want to find out if the five-day notice is appropriate, then you can contact the branch and we'll discuss what the situation is and let you know if um, no, that wouldn't be considered um, serious enough to give a five-day notice in that point you'd have to go with the warning letter and um, go with the month's notice. So you can also give notice if you are demolishing, renovating, or changing the use of your rental unit. So um, if you're going to demolish your rental unit, um, you have to do it within six months of giving notice to the tenant. If you're going to renovate the unit or the complex and the tenant needs to move out for an extended period to allow the work to be done, so we're not talking about just painting, we're talking about, um, you know, renos that are to the extent that the tenant can't live there while they're being done. Or if you're converting or changing the use, for instance, turning a residential uh, unit into a commercial unit. And then if you give notice for any of these reasons, you're required to pay up to $500 in the tenant's moving expenses. Moving expenses can be anything um, like change of address at the post office, if they hire a mover to help them move, or um, you know, hookups with cable, things like that. Those are all considered part of the moving expenses that we, we would consider in the $500. So the length of notice for this type of termination is different. Um, it's basically, uh, it is based on the vacancy rate in the area. <clears throat> so the most up-to-date vacancy rate is always posted on the Residential Tenancies Branch website, and it's based on the fall issue of the Rental Market Report. Since the current vacancy rate is less than 2%, you have to give five months notice for the tenant to move out in, in any of those situations. And if the, ten the tenant has children who go to school in the area, um, they can stay until the end of the school year. Now when you give notice uh, for renovations, the tenant has what's called the right of first refusal. Tenants who get notice to move because of the renovations um, have the right of first refusal. Before moving out, the tenant must tell you in writing that they want to have the right to move back into the unit once you've completed the renovations. <clears throat> now, in some situations, the branch would approve a rent increase or an exemption as a result of these renovations. So we're talking about maybe if there's a, a complex <coughs> rehab or a unit by unit rehab. The tenant can come back to the rental unit, but they have to pay the, the higher rent. You can also give um, written notice to end a tenancy if you want to move into the rental unit yourself or if you, give an, if you want your spouse to move in, your spouse's adult children to move in, um, your adult children, or either you or your spouse's parents to move in. On a month-to-month -month tenancy, you must give three months written notice to move out. On a fixed-term tenancy, you must give tenants three months notice before the end of their lease. And if the tenants have children who go to school accessible to the rental unit, again, they get to stay until June 30th. And if you give a tenant notice for this reason, 
you do have to pay again a reasonable moving cost up to a maximum of $500. <clears throat> You may give tenants written notice to move if you sell your rental property and any of the following people are moving into the unit. If the buyer is going to move in, the spouse of the buyer, an adult child of the buyer, or the parents of the buyer. You can't just give a tenant notice to move out because you intend to sell the property. If you sell the property, the person who's buying it may still may be buying it as a revenue property and therefore they just assume the tenant. The buyer must ask the landlord who's selling the property in writing to give written notice to the tenant to move out. And if the notice is given for this reason, again, reasonable moving costs up to a maximum of $500. <clears throat> Length of notice for this situation, um, if it's a month-to-month -month agreement, um, it depends on the vacancy rate. If the vacancy rate is less than 3%, which it is now, you have to give a tenant three months notice to move out. On a fixed term agreement, you must give the tenants three months notice before the end of the lease. Again, if the tenants have school aged children, they stay till the end of June. And if you give them notice for this reason, again, it's reasonable moving costs up to a maximum of $500. So when a tenant moves out, um, they're required to take their belongings with them. Sometimes tenant leave things behind and you need to decide what to do with them. Um, first thing is you must make reasonable effort to contact the tenant about picking up their property. And to protect yourself, we would like you to follow the requirements of the Residential Tenancies Act to dispose of the abandoned property. <clears throat> so if you decide that the tenants ha or that the items have monetary value, you, uh, you need to fill in a form. It's also available in your packet and online. Um, it is the Tenants Abandoned Property form. Um, you have to store the items for 60 days. And after the 60 days, the branch will authorize you to sell the items, usually by public auction. If the tenant owes you money under a branch order, uh, you can put the, the sale proceeds towards the order. If you don't have an order or the tenants don't owe you money, you, ha you have to send them the sale proceeds to the branch and the branch holds, the, um, holds it for the tenants for two years. After the two years, the money is transferred to a fund that the branch uses to provide educational materials for landlords. So again, that's um, if it ends up being transferred into the fund, it goes towards the information sessions that we're providing you, forms, that type of thing. <clears throat> If you decide that the items have limited monetary value, um, basically what that means is that if the items were sold and the sale proceeds wouldn't cover the cost of moving, storing, and selling them, they would be considered limited value. You should still list the um, items on the, on the form that I mentioned before. Um, you need to send the completed form to the tenant's address. If you don't know the tenant's address, you're going to send it to the last known address, which is most likely the rental, your rental unit. But if the tenant's done a change of address at the post office, that should be forwarded off to them. Once you've done this, uh, the branch will give you permission to dispose of the items. Um, if the items have no monetary value, you believe they're unsafe or unsanitary to store, you can dispose of them without authorization from the branch, with one exception. If the tenant leaves personal papers behind or photographs, you're required to store them for 60 days and at the end of the 60 days, dispose of them properly. So if we're talking about um, personal papers, you want to shred them so that they're not just thrown in a garbage and somebody else has access to them. And you still have to complete the inventory form and send it to the branch even if you determine that the items have no value. <clears throat>